So our next panel is titled Lessons from the Pandemic, What Works? Solutions from Classrooms. What have we learned during the pandemic as, or as we emerge from the pandemic that can help us address ongoing challenges? And our moderator for this panel is Dr. Lana Summers Rocha, who is Associate Teaching Professor in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching at the University of Kansas. And Dr. Rocha, I'm so pleased to have you here today. And I'm gonna go ahead and just turn it over to you. Thank you. Hey, great. Thank you so much for, for all that you've done to have this, this panel and this conference. Um, I'm really excited to, to hear what our speakers have to say today, because as we all know, this has definitely been a challenge. And I'm sure that we've all have walked away from the pandemic with some solutions and some questions um, and even more questions, right? And so I'm really looking forward to what they have to share today. So we have three speakers. We'll roughly have about 15, 20 minutes for each speaker with a little bit of time after each one to maybe answer, ask and answer a few questions and then about 15 minutes at the very end. So our first speaker for today is Janie Hu. Um, J Janie is a Chinese language teacher at Overland Trail Middle School um, with the Blue Valley Schools in Overland Park. She has been in education for 11 years with seven years in high school and four years in middle school teaching Mandarin Chinese. She has many years experiences in Star Talk as a teacher and a lead teacher. And hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about that. Besides teaching, Janie has been writing and applying thematic units and integrated performance assessments for Blue Valley Chinese programs. So welcome, Janie, and excited to hear what you have to say. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I used to be a high school teacher, and now I am a middle school teacher. Uh, a little background. Uh, oh, today, <laughs> um, I reflected uh, things that have worked in my classroom and I felt I will be constantly and continually using these strategies. So that's what I will share with everyone today. Maybe someone already using this and uh, maybe someone didn't. So possibly hope you will take away one or two things would bring to your own classroom. Uh, so my presentation is based on my teaching experience of the recent four years in Blue Valley Public Schools. We are sixth, seventh, and eighth grade uh, Mandarin Chinese classroom. So for our district, sixth grade will learn one semester Chinese, which will be two units. And the seventh and eighth grades will be four year Chinese. Uh, they'll learn four units each year. Uh, the difference probably from other school districts is we are doing thematic units with high school. So middle school students learn exactly the same thing high school students are learning. So we face the challenges of a classroom students are learning hard subject, uh, hard content, and uh, they will be tested the same as high school students as well. Then the purpose is when they go to high school, they will be in Chinese level three. So that's what our curriculum is look like. And uh, so the first thing is collaborative learning. I think it's not a strange term. Um, this is the first thing is because each year when I gave students surveys, and ask what works well and what you think we should do more. And interestingly, it always come back to, please give us more opportunities to work with our friends. Although I felt I'm a teacher really care about this topic, but the kids want more. And I think as a teacher, it's like, we can look at how often, how many opportunities we are providing with the students. And uh, I especially find out that this helps when this curriculum in my classroom and the students learn things so differently. And some people learn faster, some people learn slower. And it makes the classroom very challenging. Like in a beginning level of Chinese one, Chinese two, we are already thinking so much about differentiated learning. Otherwise, kids cannot continue 
which is not something I wanted to see. Like I want to keep their interest, but you cannot keep the content simple. So, and what we do, uh, especially when sometimes a learning task is super hard, like Chinese reading, then how do you keep your students all going? So when thinking about these things, and when I applied it, and I find out in my classroom, when we are always thinking about how I get my slow learner catch up, at the same time, what about the gifted students in my class? What about the faster learners? Like, so collaborative learning really would fit students with all levels if you design it like, like do some little trick. And at the same time, kids like it. I think there are two things. One, they want to be with their friends. They come to school, they don't want to just hear from you. When I teach for too long time, they are tired of it. But when you place them with their students, yes, they are happy and they learn together. At the same time, and they will hear multiple voices about the same problem instead of hear one voice from me. So one example is, like I said, reading in Chinese is super hard. So I started to have students read together, like go back to the old fashioned way. I just print out the flashcards with the topic we are learning. So you can tell from each group, this one student from with the gray t-shirt and this girl, they, that's the vocabulary they are having. And they are just going to read. Then the, the first round, they will read with their partner together. Then they'll figure out what they both know and something maybe this person know, that person doesn't know, they can help each other. Then they'll ask me to solve the other things they don't know. So I was able to be released from just uh, for everyone, but float in the classroom to answer just those specific questions. Then to, to keep everyone on task, and I design a tally card for them. So each student will have a tally card will with them the whole unit when we are learning. If this unit has six lessons, so they'll be tally this many times. Then there will be one student to read, then the other two will be make sure, okay, did this person read the correct? If correct, they'll tally. Then they'll say, okay, for lesson one, Amy read 16 words out of 18. Then tallied by Timothy. Then they have to record. Sometimes when I find out students need more time on the vocabs, then I will have them tally a second round. So through maybe a 20 minutes activity for 12 to 20 vocab each, each week we have to learn, these students will be repetitively learned so many times compared to other activities I will do together with them. And I will be just to float around and I'll be observing and uh, yeah, seeing. So another activity like also reading, but it will be a little bit harder. And I also ask the students to read it out loud. So it's also speak out to help them read as well. It's apples to apples. So this way I can place a very fast learner, a medium learner and a slow learner on a table. Sometimes could be four kids. And uh, so they will receive starter cards in Chinese and ender cards in Chinese. So they will take turns to be judged to see does the beginning of a sentence match the ending of a sentence. So they have to read, understand also say it out in Chinese. So similarly with a bunch of Chinese vocabs in the character, in 20 minutes of class time, they can practice so many times. They actually have to understand each other to be able to be the judge because they have to take turns. So this would be a little harder uh, reading and uh, speaking activity compared to earlier vocabs. Uh, in writing, you could also do collaborative learning. 
So one example, um, at the end of a lesson, when students are learning daily routines, so I just put some photos, could be middle school's daily routine on a slide and ask them to work with a partner. So this is a two person work to write one to two captions to describe the photo. For this kind of creative writing activities, uh, my fast learners always just say, okay, why can't I just do it by myself? It will be way faster and I can get it done easily. Then your slow learner, learner would be, oh no, I can't do this. Like, I can't maybe even express my daily routine like in a very confident way. Like how could I describe a photo in Chinese and I have to write it out. Then your middle learner will be constantly asking you, is this sentence right? If I wanna say this, what's this word for this? I think I will be so busy in the classroom and I cannot help everyone. So similarly, I place a fast learner, medium learner, and a slow learner on one table. So I ask them, each person could come up something. Then they have to decide which caption they will be put on to their final work. So each person have to write down that same sentence after they say it. So, um, so I explain to kids, the reason we wanna do this is you cannot be positively sure that yes, I am smart and my answer is the best. So a group collection of wisdom always better. And when I explain to them, they buy into this. They say, oh yes, that, that is true. Then I explain what it's like. Like instead of say, one person say, okay, this picture can be this. Then they say, okay, we just write this down. So we explain the purpose is not come up an answer and get it done. The purpose is come up a description, best describe the picture, also, you felt you gave it a good description, show off your Chinese. So explaining to kids what you want this to look like, help them when they are on their own. Also, I find out it's very important you just teach kids the collaborative learning skills. So before we let them go, I put this on the board and discuss the five minutes with my kids. is like, when other people is saying, like how you listen. And uh, when people said something, maybe not that great, like what you are going to say, are you going to just say, oh, that's dumb. Oh, that sucks. Because middle school boys will say that. And, uh, or how do you ask an artful question say, how we adjust this sentence as a team so our description will be better? Like how you ask that kind of question. That's like something I wanted them to do. And also I have students, they kind of, I want my answer to be on the description for the team. I don't want your answer. Like, so like how we should be negotiating when we are working as a team. Uh, so I ask the students, they kind of, when you ask them this question and they think about it, then they actually came up with a solution. Um, one is you take turns to be the decision maker after everyone shares. Or each person gave a term, then they both write both. Um, as a description and have me decide. I said, it sounds good. Just anything your group agrees, which makes you guys learn better then work that way. So after we teach the, the way how to work together, what it looks like and everyone is so attentive. And um, during the work, I find out my slow learners still find it challenging to be in a group to do this work. 
because this class is still Chinese one. So they only learned Chinese for about eight months. So I just offered, I said, okay, I seems left alone, but how do I contribute to our class as a resource? Anyone want to sit in a table with me? <laughs> so I just offered this. And interestingly, my slow learners said, I want to be in the same table with you. So I was sitting in a group um, here with four students, then we were doing it together. And uh, I kind of, you know, with that way you know them so well, then you can just work the best out of them as a group to come out to the solution. So I want to show you the Chinese one. For the same example, I went to the grade book. So Adam says, my mom helps me with homework. And Yuno said, me and my friend started doing homework last night, 7.30. And Hannah said, last night I did homework with my friend. My homework are so easy. These sentences are way fancier than the one I taught them. I taught them is just, my homework is easy. My homework is hard. Last night, I do homework like something, just very simple because they are Chinese one. But when they started to work together and you just see these very wonderful, nice works you want to see your students and everyone is happy and your slow learner get help from you, get all the time they need with you. And your fast learner are so happily because they are let go by you, they can show off how wonderful they are. And uh, my second solution is rethinking online learning games. And as a language teacher, the frequent online learning games are like Kahoot, GameKit, BlueKit, or Quizlet Live. And I do find out online learning games are fun but students are not always learn with them. So during the, these times on and off online learning, and I was thinking how these games can serve a more meaningful purpose. And some questions, maybe you already also thinking about is, when I have a few minutes left, am I just going to play a quick game to kill the time? Like, how could I serve a little bit more purpose than just that? Or we're just going to do a vocabulary reading activity. And my middle schoolers, they already tell me, yes, blue kid is mostly just play. You don't really learn much. And they know Quizlet, you, you act Quizlet live, actually you have to read more compared to blue kid or game kid. So, but sometimes they, they do need that fun moments and the relaxed moments. So what would be a moderate way, like how often you play for your class? So a couple of things I did adjust very small was, if I need to kill five, 10 minutes class time, I wanted that game to serve as a class building. Like instead I have kids just to play their best or play as a team. I always ask them to play as a class and uh, we are as a whole to break other class records. So often I on my board, this is a bad photo <laughs> and uh, I didn't take a photo I, from another photo, I cut this. So I just say, okay, for 10 minutes of time or as a normal level difficulty, this hour gain this much points or win this many blocks. Their accuracy level is this. Do we want to beat them? They say, yes. Then everyone were so happy and so pumped for the last five minutes, we want to beat them. And that's, as a class, then everyone felt, okay, I contributed something to my class and we are together. Um, also sometimes, you know, those games always have a report and I'll say last year, this class playing this much time, their accuracy level is this. Do you think we can do better than them? 
So I just like show them instead of showing individual scores is as a class, how they did for the same unit, same, same group of things we are learning. So they wanted to see where I am compared to other people. So this way, when they are playing the game, they're not just thinking about, I will be number one in my class. I will beat everyone. They are thinking, okay, is my learning as good as others? Amy, I'm going to interrupt just for a second to, sure. to let you know you have about two minutes. <gasps> okay, I'll be back. <laughs> okay. So also sometimes I set specific goals if some kids really want to challenge. And I will pull an old record and say, okay, for this level, for 10 minutes, you should read this many words. This is your proficiency level. Then the best person ever read is this much. So they kind of have an idea. When the game finishes, they got a personal record. So they can kind of compare. Then they say, okay, this is where I work towards. Okay, games. Um, I'll skip this. I think it's just to change the mindset to learning and to develop intrinsic motivations. Uh, the third thing is showcase how you work on the task. For word language learning, we go through this process is I teach, I do it together with the students. Then students, you need to do it alone by yourself. And something I find out is in students do it yourself step, maybe you can show how you do again. So your kids could gain a second learning experience from your teacher. For example, we are reading. So we practice so many things about reading. Now it's your turn to read a book. And I just say, okay, you guys wanna see how fast or how smoothly a native speaker do? Then I have them time me. Then I said, okay, I read two minutes smoothly for this story, go beat me. Then they are more attentive. Or in writing, we have to write a topic instead of have them do it. So after they learn, okay, what I like it, why I like it. Then they write about what type of food my family, friend, and I like. So I don't want them just to give me several sentences that's done. I want them to really think deep. So I said, okay, it's your turn, but this is how would I do? So if I'm going to write my family with the vocab you guys learn, this is what I'm going to say. So I give them an example. Then I give them an example about my friends. So they find, okay, it's still the same easy vocab, but it could describe a daily topic pretty good. Then I wanna show real quick. <laughs> Thank you, Lona, just a, a second so you can see what my students, this is Chinese one. This is when they learned Chinese for five months because we are unit three. Okay, so this is what, like he would say, they can talk so much, just that simple topic. You saw what we learned, my little vocab list, that's that whole lesson we are doing. Then that's what kids are writing, is they can talk a lot with their simple six month Chinese learning language. Okay, I, I think my time is up. I'm going yes, to- Yes, unfortunately, you have shared so, so many good um, strategies and ways to think about learning and teaching. What I really liked about your presentation is just that focus on intentional and purposeful um, work of the teacher and of the students, right? Really getting them to think about how they might in invoke their own agency in that work. So thank you so much. I know we have some a couple questions. You're welcome to go there and respond to people directly. We do have a couple minutes at the very end, of course. One of the comments I'm seeing is um, if we can make your 
presentation available and maybe that can be a conversation that we have Janie but if if Janie agrees we'll we'll make sure to distribute that um, so moving on thank you so much for presenting uh, moving on to our next speaker um, Anna Mackey Birchler um, and I should pull up your bio <laughs> um, is a is it Staley High School yes North okay Kansas. Staley High School okay great um, Anna has been teaching Spanish for 25 years, the majority being in college Spanish level through the UMKC um, at Staley High School in North Kansas City Schools. She's a mindful certified instructor and has been using mindfulness skills for herself and for her students many years before mindfulness was really a thing. So I'm lo really looking forward to how that was implemented during the pandemic and how you make use of that for yourself as a teacher, of course, but also for your students. Welcome, Anna. Thank you so much. And I am so excited to be sharing this topic that I'm so passionate about. So mindfulness in the classroom, um, an anchor in the stormy seas. And we all know we've had some stormy seas uh, these past couple of years. And as a teacher, of course, I'm gonna have my learning targets. I can review what mindfulness is um, and is not. It's pretty ubiquitous. We all have heard mindfulness. Uh, I can learn some brain facts with a few favorite practices of my students to anchor in the stormy seas of the mind and then to hopefully maybe you can share right away in your own classroom with your students. Uh, and before I begin, I do want to give homage to Mindful Momentum. That is where I am certified through. It's actually a local company in Lee Summit. And I'll be sharing some brain facts that I learned from them and with their slides today. Um, and if you want more information, by the way, on this company, um, please reach out to me. I am so grateful that this has come into my life the past couple of years. They have programs for schools. You can see on the screen, resiliency for students, empowering teens now and for life. So um, first of all, let's review what is mindfulness. It's being in the present moment without judgment. We all know that uh, mindfulness is not a spiritual Buddhist practice. It's not this visual. A lot of people turn away automatically from it, uh, but that's not what it is. And it's not a 45 minute lesson once a day. Um, mindfulness is sprinkled throughout every single day in little mini micro nuggets, we call them. Um, mindfulness really is conscious breathing. You're anchoring into the present moment without judgment through conscious breathing. And right now I'm probably gonna have to do some conscious breathing because my dog just walked in in the back here. Um, I really am going to talk through the experiences of my students. I'm starting with Mia, my sweetie pie Mia student. This was one of her favorite mindful moments that we would do. And backing up what mindfulness is and breathing and why kids love to know the why. They love to know that brain knowledge. They love to learn about their brains. So here's a little fact. Um, are you aware when we flood our brain with oxygen, it signals the body to rest? By taking deep, slow breaths through the nose, our parasympathetic nervous system is activated. The system promotes that rest and digest response within our body. This helps to cultivate a sense of peace and calm. So today in a moment, we're gonna practice taking three deep breaths through our nose and with the mantra that we began every day in our class. And I've done this for over 10 years. Um, and I would like you all to practice with me, by the way, I'm going to walk you through a minute or two so you feel what that feels like. And you may connect with this, you may not. That's why we're practicing several different mindful things. And same with kids. You may connect with it, you may not. Wherever you are, honor where you are. If you want to close your eyes, close your eyes. If you don't, you don't have to. You can lower your grade. You can turn off your screen if you want. And I'm just going to lead you through two minutes of not even two minutes. And you can see how maybe how different you feel. So here we go. We're going to start out with just taking a deep breath in, conscious breath. We're breathing in and we're breathing out. That's conscious breathing. I'm paying attention to my breath. I'm breathing in and I'm breathing out. And I'm going to relax my eyes. Maybe I close them. I'm going to relax my jaw. I'm going to relax those shoulders. And I'm gonna say inside my head or outside, peace begins with me. La paz empieza conmigo. We're just gonna take those deep three breaths in and out, knowing that that's a cleansing breath because it cleans out your toxins, it really does.
and they'll usually end with a bell because a bell in Peru uh, eliminates all the bad negative energies. So the kids sometimes love that. And then we repeat one more time, peace begins with me. And um, teaching kids at that peace, it doesn't mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It's not unicorns and rainbows, like it said in the video. It really means to be in the midst of all those things because that's life and still finding that little calm in your heart and just teaching them that life, they keep waiting for it to, to get calm. Well, that's never gonna happen. We know it, life is always like this and teaching them to embrace that, it's really powerful for them. When they develop that awareness with a self-understanding of their brain, like, oh, it's not my fault I'm doing this. It's my brain, it's my amygdala acting. That is lasting change for them. And again, just little nuggets throughout every day, just one 45 minute lesson, that's nothing for them, modeling it and doing for them. Um, Viktor Frankl is a Holocaust survivor. And I love this quote, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space that we can create with our breath is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. And uh, learning again, those micro moments through every day, it's not a 45 minute lesson, it's a journey of practice that's never a destination. I tell the kids I've been doing it for 20 years and I'm never there. I've always got to remind myself, uh, I got to do some mindfulness and I love learning new skills. I'm always learning. I want to share with you um, a story of Trent. Um, I shared Mia's favorite. This is Trent's favorite um, meditation. This actually was before the pandemic. Um, I had him four or five years ago as a student but I received a letter from him that I'll explain later, just this past fall. So Trent loved learning about the brain. Um, our amygdala controls, and I'm trying to get, here we go, now I can read it. The amygdala controls our emotions. Did you know that? Ooh, going back to that other slide. Sorry, I'm trying to be able to read my slide here. The amygdala is a tightly packed group of cells found within the brain. This area coordinates responses to our environment, especially fear by alerting us to danger. When it perceives danger, whether real or imagined, it chooses to fight, flight, or freeze. This is an important mechanism for survival. And we can calm the firing of that amygdala through slow, deep breathing. So just teaching the kids about the amygdala, and sometimes you can say, call her Amy because she's acting up like, Amy, that's my, my amygdala going on here. Um, giving it a hug through breathing to calm you down. And if you have never read Siegel, Dr. Siegel's uh, book, Brainstorm, this is absolutely essential as a teacher to understand how teenage brains work, or even as a parent, um, it's amazing. So I put that on there as a suggestion for a read if you haven't read that. I could talk more about it, but I want to move on to, this is Trent, that same kiddo that you saw that I got a letter from. Oh, wow, and I, I thought I was over that emotion, but he actually um, had brain cancer. And I received a letter three days before he died, penned by his mom. First of all, apologizing that he didn't continue his Spanish in college, um, but he did use his Spanish um, to meet a hot girl when he went on spring break. Um, but mostly for the mindful skills that he learned, that breathing piece just had helped him so much in dealing with all the fear that he had um, through his life. I actually have the letter um, right here. Just as a teacher, knowing that you can teach your kids life skills, like who cares about Spanish? It's those life skills that are so, so important. And now with the pandemic, um, I'll move on to Sydney, who I still have as a student. Um, by the way, I have permission from all these kiddos to use their pictures and their parents. Um, I have Sydney in here. Um, Sydney is an athlete and a student, and you all have those as well. And the pressure and stress of life just now for any kid. And I just got a letter from her um, this past month and stating the, the mindful skill I'm going to share with you that really has changed her life. Um, she loved this fact, knowing she's not different. Research shows that our brains have not sufficiently evolved to absorb and process the rapid stimulation they are constantly bombarded with in our fast paced technology driven world. While you may not realize it, your brain can't keep up. 
The more our brain struggles to keep up, the more our brain strain, slow down and lock up. Like just knowing our brains, those kids knowing their brains haven't developed yet to deal with their social media and their phones. That's why they're so full of anxiety and so stressed out. Their brains have not cut up. So when they know that, they, it's like they, it releases them a little bit and knowing I, I've got to figure out how to work this brain that hasn't caught up yet. So she loved um, the mindful skill, again, knowing that about our brain, um, a go-to phrase. So teaching kids, okay, what, what's your trigger? Um, for her, um, she really had a lot of triggers when she was at school. She'd think about her sports. When she was at sports, she'd think about her, her school. So she would just have, um, how do I get rid of that stress? So you can create that pause that we were talking about, that breath with what's called a go-to phrase. You got to have some real go-to phrases in your pocket when you're feeling stressed out. We started with my favorite one today, peace begins with me. And that just adds that little space. Um, another one that my students love, and I learned this from Adrian, if you've ever heard of Adrian and yoga, my breath is my anchor. My anchor is my breath. It is what it is. It'll become what I make of it. And this was Sydney's favorite. It's okay to not be okay. Just having that phrase helped release some stress and anxiety for her. Um, this is one my colleagues and I use all the time. We're all doing the best that we can with what we have and what we know. And it just, again, creates that buffer phrase, that pause to help us deal with other students, with other adults. Like you don't understand why they're doing what they're doing and it creates that anxiety. We're all just doing the best we can with what we have and what we know. And I'm gonna invite you all to, in the chat box, if you have a moment, what's a phrase that you go to, that you use, that you know, that already helps you and share that with your kiddos. And for sake of time, I'm gonna keep moving, but I can't wait to read um, some phrases that maybe you have. The last mindful skill I'm gonna share with you is just movement. It is so, so important for kids to move. They are not meant to be sitting in a classroom in a desk for seven, eight hours. We can't do it. They can't do it. They, they just can't. So every single day we move, there has never been a day other than a test day that kids sit in, in my classroom for 90 minutes. We are always up and about doing different activities. I'll share um, one with you in a minute. Here's Adrian I was just talking about. There's a link I can share with you. Kids love this little six minute yoga desk um, that anyone can do. So yoga at your desk. It's just that movement, getting up that stress out of their bodies. So again, how can you figure out how to do these little mindful skills and what you do every day? This is one of my favorites, um, Name It to Tame It. That came from Dr. Siegel as well. Um, it can be an oral or writing activity. So I use it as a writing activity in my sea of monsters, I called it, as a language teacher. Um, I teach language and we do an activity where I have students guide each other through this sea of monsters um, practicing their Spanish. And as you can see in the photos, we had a new use for those stupid masks. We use them as blindfolds. Uh, so before we do the sea of monsters, I had them write down on a piece of paper or draw what is a monster in your life, because we all have monsters and those monsters are going to change throughout your life. Just naming it to tame it is so important. So they wrote down or they drew um, whatever was a monster at that current time. I used the example of my daughter's boyfriend who had broken up with her at finals, like at MU, duh, wrote his head on there, you know. And then we take that paper and I'm sure you've heard of this activity before. We just squish it up and we throw that baby into our sea of monsters. And it's a little lesson in life. You, you just got to get through it. That's how you do it, guys. You got to get through it. So here's a little um, activity. They're moving, they're using their language and they love, love, love collaboration, just like Jeannie was just saying earlier. So I know my time is coming to a close and I just want to remind you that mindfulness is a journey. It is not a destination, it's a continued practice. And if something didn't work, try something else because you never, never know when you're gonna get a letter from a kiddo like Trent or Sydney or Mia, and that it truly was life-changing for them to learn this skill. And we as teachers, we need it ourselves. I've got more information. Um, and just keep in mind, teenagers still like sparkles. It doesn't matter if they're eight or they're 18, they still like sparkles and helping them be aware, develop that awareness with them and teach them that self-understanding. That's what is lasting change. 
So as a teacher, my learning targets, I hope that you learned um, a little bit more of mindfulness and you've learned maybe a brain fact that maybe you didn't know before or you can teach your students uh, and to help your own stormy mind and that of your students. Thank you so much for allowing me to um, share this with you today. Thank you, Anna. And I'm sure all of us feel a little bit calmer <laughs> now after <laughs> taking a few minutes to breathe and relax. Um, I really appreciate what you said. And that kind of connects to um, Janie's talk a little bit about the intention and the purpose, right? You're not just teaching Spanish, you're teaching a whole array of life skills as well that hopefully they can take into the future. Um, uh, lots of great comments coming across about just phrases that we we carry. So go ahead and keep keep those comments coming. They're wonderful. Um, dotting a few of them down. But we're going to go ahead and move to Joe Keegan as our final speaker, and then hopefully we'll have some time to um, ask questions and engage in some conversation. So Joe is an instructional coach at Broken Arrow Elementary School and Shawnee Mission Schools. Um, he has had a variety of roles within education, a Title I math aide, a classroom teacher, an administrative intern, and is currently an instructional coach. Uh, Joe has worked in a variety of settings, a military base, a small town in Western Kansas. I'm from Western Kansas, so I'm kind of curious which one, um, and in more affluent districts. He leverages technology and relationship, relationships to elevate teaching and learning. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Um, it was funny when I was writing that biography. At first, I typed it up and it sounded like a police report, just like this is this is Joe. And I had to have a friend look at it and help me with it. Um, so yeah, you were talking, I've been in a variety of places. The small town was uh, Elkhart, Kansas. The city limit touched Oklahoma and Colorado. And one of my favorite jokes, because I teach in Johnson County, is that it was legitimate Western Kansas. Normally, Johnson County is like, oh, Topeka? And so, um, yeah, I was out there. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, show my slides. And it's actually reminding me of something that a parent said to me uh, several years ago. Um, I had had a couple of her, uh, oh, I need to present. Um, a couple of her children in class and uh, she came in and sat down for conferences and she looks around and she just goes this is such a man's classroom um I said what do you mean I got like I got posters on the walls it's so colorful in here and she goes that's true but you know everyone else's looks like you know they got on Pinterest and had all these cute things and uh I was like well I I think it looks fine um so anyways keep that in mind as we go through my slideshow here it's not near as cute as the last two um so the lessons from the pandemic i took it a little bit differently than the other two mine are not going to be as like hyper specific activities there are things that are both structural that you can talk about like as a school something you can be an advocate for in your school but then things that you can also be an advocate for in your classroom um, and I think the biggest takeaway that I, I really want to stress to teachers in my role is that things are not going to go back to the way they were before. We have had two very intense years um, of experiences for teachers and students. And I know, you know, a lot of people are like, I just want things to go back to normal. And honestly, they're probably not going to go back to normal. We don't go through an experience like this and then just ignore it and go back to the way things were before. And so we need to adjust our thinking and think and say, what do we do from here on out rather than let's just go back to doing things normally. Um, one of the first things I wanna talk about is an interventionist mindset that we really need to get into um, within our classrooms. Um, and that's talking about the need for teachers to be the primary interventionist. Um, you know, working in a variety of settings has given me kind of a good perspective on a variety of things. You know, sometimes when you work in one school um, that they may not have a lot of kids that need interventions that are below grade level. And so those kids that do need it end up going to a specialist, whether it's the reading specialist or an ESOL teacher or something like that. But I've also worked in other schools in which 
there are so many students that have heavy needs that the teacher has to be the primary interventionist and they work with those students there in the classroom as well. And as we're seeing with academic needs coming out of the pandemic or as we continue through it, is that kids have a lot of academic needs and the teachers need to be that interventionist for them. And to go along with that, we also need to make sure that teachers are getting the training on how to be an interventionist because for, the, for a lot of the interactions I have, it's not that the teacher doesn't want to do it, it's that they don't feel like they are the biggest expert on how to best meet the needs of those students. And so that means that schools are gonna to have to continue you to do ongoing professional learning about what does it mean to be an interventionist? What are some tools, some strategies that you can use to help your students close those gaps that they might have? Um, and then just taking ownership of the student needs. I mentioned earlier, sending them to another person. And, you know, that's something that perhaps before the pandemic we were able to do, but it's just we're learning that we need to take ownership and they are all our students. We can't just say, well, this kid needs reading help. So he's going to go to the reading specialist. You are the person there with the majority of the time. So you need to be the one that is working with those tier one interventions to try and help. And then you can utilize the expertise of the other people in the school. And if a student does need to go to them, you can use that as well. But taking the ownership and saying, I am the person that is here for the students and I'm going to be the one to help them. Um, and then I continuous learning on how to best meet student needs. It can't just be a one time PL where, oh, the teachers have gotten trained. They're good now, but it's continuous learning, just ongoing professional learning about how we're going to best help those students and help those teachers be ready to help the students. And then a lot of that's going to come back to small group instruction. And we know that small group instruction has shown to have a very large effect um, on student engage or student um, gains in their learning. And you know that that doesn't mean just setting them up in rotations and you know, all right, 15 minutes with this group, 15 minutes with this group, 15 minutes and just rotating them through. Uh, it means moving to more of a skill-based model where you may have a kid that comes up to your small group a couple times that day. Um, a, and then the next day, maybe they don't. Um, you still try your best to see every single student, but the groups are more fluid. You don't keep them in the same group for an entire month or a quarter or semester or a year. You're taking data, you're looking at the interventions that you've been doing and seeing if they're helping your students. Um, the second thing that I think we can really take away from this is that our best practices for our ESOL and students in special education are really our best practices for everyone. You know, an easy example of that is the PSYOP model. Um, and get excited, here's the one picture that I added to, <laughs> to my slideshow. Um, so the components of the PSYOP model, um, lesson preparation, building background, comprehensible input strategies, uh, interaction with their peers and the teacher, practice and application, a variety in lesson delivery, and then review and assessment of where the student's at. Those are good teaching practices for anybody, not just our students who um, are designated as English language learners. And so taking that and utilizing that in our lesson planning and assessment and preparation going forward, I feel is a really critical part of where we're going next. Um, and you know, just variation in teaching strategies. Um, this, is a, this is a good chance for us to say, I'm not going to be just standing up and writing on the whiteboard or the chalkboard or whatever it is every day. You know, this is your chance to really think to yourself, what is something that I have been wanting to try in my classroom? Maybe it's a different Kagan strategy that you've seen, but this is a chance to do that and um, go through and try those different strategies to meet the student's needs because not every student is going to learn from just one strategy. You know, for our students that are in special education that um, have ESOL support, we adapt the assignments and most teachers are doing this already, but it's just, it's a good practice to be doing this for all of our students that are in there. 
because we don't want to create barriers to seeing if they are really learning. And then individualized instruction, like, um, you know, not every student needs like an explicitly written IEP with things, but, you know, I, I think I've, I've got four kids of my own. And I think I thought when I was in the classroom, what is it that I would want my child's teacher doing for them? And whatever that was, that's what I did for the students that were in my classroom because they were somebody else's kids as well that wanted the very best for them. And so going through and realizing that every student's going to need something individual, that doesn't mean write out 26 different lesson plans, but be aware that you may have four different forms of the assessments um, for the students in there so that you can truly see if the learning is happening. Um, another lesson from the pandemic, sorry, I know I'm flying through here, but I've got my timer going and um, there's a lot. Uh, I was talking about where our gaps lay, such as in reading. Um, you know, I help with, uh, I've been in Blue Valley and helping with their summer school and we've been doing a lot with structured literacy and we're discovering more and more where some of our instruction has been missing, some of those gaps for kids. Um, but then there's also this gap in teachers feeling a lack of knowledge to meet those student needs with structured literacy. And so coming out of that, uh, coming out of the pandemic, how can we address that? And that's just gonna be ongoing professional learning and ongoing instruction for those students. In math, you know, with the segmented years that we've had in 2020, we had, most of us had that last quarter, we weren't in the buildings. Um, and then for the next year, we were either 100% virtual or we were half virtual, half in person. And it just, there's further gaps and we can't assume a level of knowledge and um, skills that our students will have anymore. So we need to be using screeners and checking to see where those skills are missing and then going through to backfill them. And then also it's exposing some of our academic behaviors that may not have been taught explicitly, but now we realize we need to be teaching students explicit organization skills and how to assign what is the most important task that you have to do today and helping them with their ability to focus for long periods of time. And then we're also seeing some gaps in um, acting out behaviors. And we need to be looking at how to address these beyond sending the students to the office or just calling the counselor or the social worker or the instructional coach or somebody else to come help. Helping teachers know how to intervene before the behaviors escalate to, to a certain point. Um, and that can be making plans. I could, I could go on for 30 minutes about each of these and I realize I'm rushing through them. Um, blended learning, you know, we went virtual and exposed some of those gaps that not every family has access to internet in the same way. Not everyone has a safe or quiet place to work when they are at home, whether it's during the school day or after. And, you know, realizing that parents are trying their best, but they're not always available to help, you know, I, I realize that um, we have some schools and school districts where you could call home and the parents were always available to do one thing or another to help you out. And that's not necessarily the case anymore because parents are also dealing with their own set of needs and work and changes. Um, you know, I, I know me personally, I, in my experience, is nobody liked looking at a screen that long. It, it clearly has emotional effects on the adults and the children and it has physical effects. And then, you know, a lot of things we do on a screen are activating that dopamine in our brains and it's easy to become addicted to it. People talk a lot about children being addicted to their screens. And I would say that we have adults that are just as addicted to that. And we've got to think, how do we respond to that? It doesn't, you know, instead of competing with the screen, could we, do we need to change the way that students think and have metacognition and approach their learning to do things a little bit slower and um, more focused? Um, and so adapting to that and realizing that if we can't compete with it, perhaps we need to approach it from a different way. 
and I say no one liked looking at a screen that long. I did not officially take a survey. Maybe somebody did like looking at a screen that long. If you did, I, I apologize for lumping you in with that group. Um, and then, you know, we want to move beyond blended learning being solely focused on devices. Blended learning is called that for a reason. It's because you're doing things physically and with your hands and also using technology. It's using your SAMR model to, you know, we're not just doing substitution, we're replacing and redoing things in a way that we couldn't before. Um, and it's not just 100% on that device. Um, behavior and behavior management. We're all coming from a traumatic experience these last two years. The level of trauma varies family to family. And we can't expect it to go back as the same as it was before. Um, I know that all of my fellow colleagues and friends that I've talked to saw an uptick in behaviors. And we'll probably continue to see that because of the stress that people have been under for the last two plus years. And the adults aren't reacting well, the children aren't reacting well. And so we need to come at it from a trauma sensitive perspective and think what can we do to help these students and these adults work through these things. And then going back to the academic behaviors is being clear on what we really want to see and what students need for the next level. I know I've taught in the grade level before they go to middle school and everyone says, oh, we need to have them moving class to class to get them ready. When in reality, we really need to teach them how to be organized, how to take notes and things like that. Um, and then, you know, we just need to make sure that we're connecting, uh, using morning meetings and things like that, building the relationships. Um, kids are gonna work for someone that they trust. And so we need to make sure that they trust us and we are truly listening to them instead of just giving them our attention for a few seconds till we can move on to something else. And then being honest with the kids, telling them we're working on this because this is part of our district curriculum. This is part of our state standards. Like we don't have to say, because I said so. All right, there's my timer. Um, and then yeah, super, just make sure we supervise our staff emotional well-being. And that means connecting and checking in on people. So there we go, sorry, I tried to fly through. You did a great job. Um, Thank you. Such important points. And I, I was thinking as you were talking about the connections between Anna's presentation and your own, um, how maybe mindfulness can be part of the solution to connecting with, with ourselves and connecting with others. Um, so I appreciate that, that connection there. Um, I want to turn to kind of just a, an open discussion and question time. So feel free to write your questions in the chat um, or I think you have access to, to say them out loud as well. We do have one question that was posted previously, so I'll just share that one. Um, Janie, someone was wondering if you have a particular strategy for grouping students together, such as a sociogram, and I'm not entirely sure how that works, but uh, do you have some thoughts there? Yes, I, uh, I answered that person, but I think someone else may want to know. So, I always put learning skills and the learning level as my first consideration based on the task. That will be my first uh, grouping. Then secondly, I will see students' personalities. I will make sure this group do not have a drama during the task. And the middle schoolers, they can have many dramas. <laughs> Then thirdly, I will look over and make sure, yes, I am allowing my students have the opportunity to interact with everyone. And uh, I always tell them, although Chinese is elective, but they change core teachers each year and they stick with me for three years. I told them these people, we will be three year friends and very close friends. So we needed to know each other, support each other and help each other. And also I asked them, it's a skill. You are capable of working with any kind of people you like or don't like your type or not your type in the future world. So let's practice it in this classroom. I need to see that in you. So that's what I tell my kids. And this is what I want them to be. Yeah, and it seems like all three of you have kind of 
touched on the, the idea of like being explicit with students, telling them why we're doing this or telling them why we need to learn this, how I expect you uh, to behave, behave and interact with each other, that aspect of being explicit. Um, some great comments coming in. I also wanted us to just take a minute to pause and think about what's your greatest takeaway from these three presenters? Um, what are some things that you're thinking about or hoping to do? So if you could just briefly just type that in the chat, that, that might be a good way to, to kind of wrap up. Any other questions? I should have said, what other questions do you have? <laughs> There's always questions. I have a comment in um, Joe, you said something that was really powerful to me that it's not gonna go back to the way it was before and it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that was really powerful. You saying that, you know, it's a great opportunity to change things up because kids aren't the same and the world isn't the same kid and we aren't the same so that was just really powerful I wanted to say that no it shouldn't go back to the way it was but figuring out how to make it better that's the challenge yeah <laughs> it's challenging go oh, goodness yes I, I don't have all the answers if someone else does please let me know me too me too <laughs> Joe, I'm kind of curious, you didn't get a chance to talk about that last slide of, you know, supporting each other or supporting staff. Um, I'm kind of curious, just uh, what are your some initial thoughts about that? Like, what have you seen to be effective? Um, what have you all been doing? I just realized I was muted. You know, one thing that I have found to be best is to just be direct about it. Um, I'm going to say something that sounds like a joke, but is more serious than I, it sounds, is that traditionally people from the Midwest, when you ask them how they are doing, their automatic response is, I'm fine. And, you know, everyone just says, okay. Um, or, you know, they, you pass someone in the hall and you say, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm good. Um, and, you know, no one ever really says how they're doing because we don't necessarily ask to genuinely know. And so I think, directly asking people, how are you doing? And then if they say fine, following up in a way that if you've noticed something, telling them the truth and saying, are you sure? You seem like something's been bothering you lately. And, you know, being that direct can be uncomfortable. Um, but if you talk with people regularly and you are that direct and you, they can tell that you're coming from a place of genuine concern. I think it allows you to help others in, in a way because they're willing to open up with that. And, you know, I think administrators in schools have done a great job of realizing that sometimes you need to send somebody home because they are not okay. Not that they're not like not that they're hurting students, but you can tell that they are in pain and teachers are notorious across the board for saying, no, I can teach today or being so stressed out about doing lesson plans. Um, in the past few years, I've seen a lot of people step up and say, hey, we've got your lesson plans. Don't worry about it. And just teams coming together about that. Um, and you know, something that I, I worked hard to do where in the places that I'm working is find some way to express gratitude and appreciation and recognition of effort. Um, I'm sure all of us have seen the research saying that it's better to comment and kind of reward the student's effort on things instead of saying like, oh, you're so smart, but you worked really hard on this. And, you know, it may feel weird at first because we don't typically give that to other adults, but I think if we work on that and say things like, hey, I saw that lesson that you did on the, in there with um, the sea of monsters, and that was great because it got the kids collaborating so much, like just something small like that and showing people that you recognize what they're doing, it just established that connection. So then when somebody is struggling, they may feel more comfortable 
coming to you about it. I realize I said a lot of words and I don't know that I actually gave any concrete um, advice there. I apologize. <laughs> I summarize that as just making tight, making space and time to be human, right? To recognize yeah. what people are doing, to check in on each other. Uh, and, and listening, you know, that's, a, I think that's the biggest thing is like listening between the words that are being said is the biggest piece of advice that I can give. I'm not seeing a lot of takeaways um, in the chat. So I'm kind of wondering, do we not have takeaways <laughs> or just jotting them down individually, which is fine as well. Other comments or questions? Just a few notes then um, as we wrap up. Aspen has placed an evaluation, uh, a link to an evaluation form in the chat. And I'm sure we'd all like to get your input about this session and, and what you would um, like to see in the future. And then those for needing PD points for the conference, there's also a link there in the chat. Um, so I'll direct your attention to that. And if there's nothing else, I guess we, Dr. Willis, what do we do? <laughs> do we just stick on or take a break? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll come on now. That okay, was perfect. Wonderful. That was wonderful. Um, thank you. Thank you, Janie, Anna, and Joe uh, for sharing your experiences with us. Those are fabulous, fabulous. Um, you know, it's, it, it's one thing for us, you know, in the ivory tower over here to talk about what we think is going on in schools but hearing from you about what's actually happening in classrooms and what the creative and amazingly imaginative and compassionate things that you are doing to, to help your students get through what, what has been for many people a really hard couple of years here is, is so inspiring to me. I just feel so moved by all of you and what you do, it, it's just incredible. Uh, and I really appreciate you taking the time today to share some of your experiences with us. I'm, I'm sure everybody who's listening uh, is also inspired by you. It was really wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you, Lana, for moderating. You did a wonderful job and I really appreciate it. Um, we are gonna take a short break now and uh, we're gonna come back at 2.45, our next presentation is on a similar theme. It's on making space for all students to thrive. So it's really about what do we do for the students who are who might otherwise be feel marginalized, which is very much in keeping of what we've been talking about during this past uh, session as well. So I hope you all will come back for that and take a short break now. Get up and breathe or have a mindful walk outside. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Thank you.